Hello and welcome to Call of the Wild 8. This is Shani Reads Chapter 3, Part 2. So as always, we are looking at the same standards. Um, one specific thing we are looking at in this is to analyze how Buck's personality traits or his abilities um, that he has had to use or gain in order to survive in the North. So what has he had to do um, in order to survive this difficult situation? Because he's had to really change as a character and as a dog. And as always, you will be answering questions um, using details from the text at the end of this video. So what happened last time? So Buck and Spitz are leading up to a huge fight. Um, in the end, only one can win. While the two are fighting, uh, the camp is attacked by starving huskies that attack the men and the dogs and eat everything that they can. While fighting other dogs, Spitz tries to attack Buck. So we start to see how really ruthless Spitz is at this point. He has no semblance of that pack protection, pack mentality. He is out to kill Buck as soon as he can. When it's all said and done, the huskies are killed or they leave and the team comes back together wounded, but they are still able to work. Um, unfortunately, because of this attack, Dolly gets rabies and tries to attack Buck, and in the process, she is killed by Francois. Um, towards the end of this reading, Buck is also encouraging the other dogs to start rebelling against Spit. And at this point, a fight to the death is coming very shortly, and we are going to see how this plays out in this second half of the chapter. All right, so what we really want to look at, because this is something that comes up, is um, pack hunting style. Now, you're going to watch a video. These are wolves in this video, but wolves are really not that much different than dogs, um, except they're more wild. But the way they're going to be hunting this hare or this rabbit is pretty much going to be the same way that they are going to describe in the book. Um, so we're going to see a scene very similar to this, except it's at night and it's in the snow. Um, the video is not graphic. Yes, the hair is caught in the end, but you know, that's pretty much where it ends. And from there, it's, it doesn't go into too much detail. Food is so hard to find this far north that a wolf pack must search hundreds of square kilometers if it's to be successful. And success means raising the next generation. <laughs> to do that here, the wolves must work together. So the young are raised not only by their parents, but by their aunts and uncles as well. Together, they try to ensure that each pup reaches near adult size before the snow returns. A growing pup needs more than just a few leverets. The wolves need bigger prey, and to catch that, they must hunt as a pack. Hairs may be easy to spot, but they're far from easy to catch. They run at 60 kilometers an hour. To catch one, the wolves work as a team. close enough to bite the hare's tail. But a hare 
now can change direction in an instant. If it can continue to sidestep and jink, it may ultimately outlast them. Finally, it gets away. For the next hair, the whole pack gives chase. Now numbers count. The lead wolves keep up the pace. Others run on either side, so the hare can't change direction. A tiny meal for the whole pack. So as you can see in that video, the hare has some definite advantages over one or two wolves. Hares can change direction very quickly and they are very fast. So even when a wolf is able to catch up with them, they can change direction much quicker than the wolf can, which makes for a longer chase. However, when you get all of the pack involved, then they kind of cut off the direction where the hare can go to. And this is essentially what we're going to see in the scene that we are going to read in this section of the story. Um, so you are going to continue on with chapter three, part two. And as always, you're gonna answer the questions on Schoology at the end. Chapter three, part two, the dominant primordial beast. Seven days from the time they pulled into Dawson, they dropped down the steep bank by the barracks to the Yukon Trail and pulled for Dia and Saltwater. Perot was carrying dispatches, if anything more urgent than those he had brought in. Also, the travel pride had gripped him, and he proposed to make the record trip of the year. Several, several things favored him in this. The week's rest and recuperated, had recuperated the dogs and put them in thorough trim. The trail they had broken into the country was packed hard by later journeyers, and further, the police had arranged in two or three places deposits of grub for dog and man, and he was traveling light. They made 60 mile, which is a 50 mile run on the first day, and the second day saw them booming up the Yukon well on their way to Pelly. But such splendid running was achieved not without great trouble and vexation on the part of Francois. The insidious revolt led by Buck had destroyed the solidarity of the team. It no longer was as one dog leaping in the traces. The encouragement Buck gave the rebels led them into all kinds of petty misdemeanors. No more was Spitz a leader greatly to be feared. The old awe departed, and they grew equal to challenging his authority. Pike robbed him of half a fish one night and gulped it down under the protection of Buck. Another night, Dub and Joe fought Spitz and made him forego the punishment they deserved. And even Billy, the good-natured, was less good-natured and whined not half so placatingly as in former days. Buck never came near Spitz without snarling and bristling menacingly. In fact, his conduct approached that of a bully, and he was given to swaggering up and down before Spitz's very nose. So even though Spitz is villainous and we haven't really liked him up until this point, his job as a leader is necessary to have a smooth run. The dogs need a leader to follow. With a new, kinder leader challenging him, they will try to get away with anything, thus making this journey very difficult. They are not working as one team anymore. This is becoming a popularity contest. Also, the one that should be followed and that should be obeyed as the leader is Francois at this point, and they're even doing things without thinking about how he's going to react or how he's going to punish them. They are basically just following Buck blindly at this point because he's kinder than Spitz's. The breaking down of discipline likewise affected the dogs in their relationship with one another. 
They quarreled and bickered more than ever among themselves, till at times the camp was a howling bedlam. Dave and Solex alone were unaltered, though they were made irritable by the unending squabbling. Francois swore strange barbarous oaths and stamped the snow in futile rage and tore his hair. His lash was always singing among the dogs, but it was of small avail. Directly his back was turned, they were at it again. He backed up Spitz with, the, with his whip, while Buck backed up the remainder of the team. Francois knew he was behind all the trouble, and Buck knew he knew. But Buck was too clever ever again to be caught red-handed. He worked faithfully in the harness, for the toil had become a delight to him. Yet it was a greater delight, slyly, to precipitate a fight amongst his mates and tangle the traces. So Buck is enjoying causing this trouble. He's almost worse than Spitz at this point. And he's encouraging disrespect among his team. And at this point, there are essentially two teams, Francois and Spitz on one side and Buck and the rest of the dogs on the other. At the mouth of the Takina, one night after supper, Dub turned up a snowshoe rabbit, blundered it, and missed. In a second, the whole team was in a full cry. A hundred yards away was a camp of Northwest police with 50 dogs, huskies all, who joined the chase. The rabbit sped down the river, turned off into a small creek up the frozen bed of which it, had, it held steadily. It ran lightly on the surface of the snow while the dogs plowed through by main strength. Buck led the pack 60 strong around bend after bend but he could not gain. He lay down low to the race, whining eagerly, his splendid body flashing forward, leap by leap in the wan moonlight, and le leap by leap, like some pale frost wraith, the snowshoe rabbit flashed on ahead. All the stirrings of old instincts which at stated, period, at stated periods drives men out from the sounding cities to forests and plain to kill things by chemically propelled laden bullets, the bloodlust, the joy to kill, all this was Buck's, only it was infinitely more intimate. He was ranging at the head of the pack, running the wild thing down, the living meat to kill with his own teeth and wash his muzzle to the eyes in warm blood. So that old instinct is taking over and he's feeling the need to hunt and kill. He wouldn't have done this on the ranch. He might have gone with um, the judge when he went out on hunts, but Buck was not the thing hunting an animal down. There's no gun in the way. There's no person in the way. He is the only thing at this point to be hunting this animal. There's an ecstasy that marks the summit of life and beyond which cannot rise. And such is the paradox of living, this ecstasy comes when one is most alive, and it comes as a complete forgetfulness that one is alive. This ecstasy, this forgetfulness of living, comes to the artist, caught up and out of himself in a sheet of flame. It comes to the soldier, war mad on a stricken field and refusing quarter. And it came to Buck, leading the pack, sounding the old wolf cry, straining after the food that was alive, and that fled swiftly before him through the moonlight. He was sounding the deep, sounding the deeps of his nature and of the parts of his nature that were deeper than he, going back into the womb of time. He was mastered by the sheer surging of life, the tidal wave of being, the perfect joy of each separate muscle, joint, and sinew, in that it was everything that was not death that it was aglow and rampant, expressing itself in movement, flying exilently under the stars and over the face of dead matter that did not move. So basically they're telling us that Buck is feeling this ecstasy, the sheer wild pleasure of being in the hunt, of running, of chasing this animal, and he's feeling all those old instincts coming back to him that he never knew he had. But Spitz, cold and calculating, even in his extreme moods, left the pack and cut across a narrow neck of land where the creek made a long bend around. Buck did not know of this, and as he rounded the bend, the frost wraith of a rabbit still flitting before him, he saw another and larger frost wraith leaping from the overhanging bank into the immediate path of the rabbit. It was Spitz. 
the rabbit could not run, and as the white teeth broke its back, in midair it shrieked as loudly as a stricken man may shriek. At sound of this, the cry of life plunging down from life's apex in the grip of death, the fall pack at Buck's heels raised a hell's chorus of delight. So Spitz cuts him off, as we saw kind of that pack fighting or that pack hunting mentality. Spitz comes around the other side and cuts off the rabbit and he catches it and he kills it. And this is basically the catalyst or the thing that is going to cause their their big one on one fight at this point. Buck did not cry out. He did not check himself, but drove in upon Spitz shoulder to shoulder so hard that he missed the throat. They rolled over and over in the powdery snow. Spitz gained his feet almost as though he had not been overthrown, slashing Buck down the shoulder and leaping clear. Twice his teeth clipped together like the steel jaws of a trap, and as he backed away for better footing with lean and lifting lips that writhed and snarled. In the flash, Buck knew it. The time had come. It was to the death. As they circled about, snarling, ears laid back, keenly watchful for the advantage, the scene came to Buck with a sense of familiarity. He seemed to remember it all, the white woods and earth and moonlight and the thrill of battle. Over the whiteness and silence brooded a ghostly calm. There was not the faintest whisper of air. Nothing moved, not a leaf quivered, and the visible breaths of the dogs rising slowly and lingering in the frosty air. They had made short work of the snowshoe rabbit, these dogs that were ill-tamed wolves, and they were now drawn up in an expectant circle. They too were silent, their eyes only gleaming and their breaths drifting slowly upward. To Buck, it was nothing new or strange. This scene of old time, it was as though it had always been the wanton way of things. So there's a ton of imagery in this section. So I want you to pause this and go back to this paragraph and see if you can find at least three examples of imagery. Remember, imagery creates feelings of tension, suspense, waiting. It builds the scene and the way we feel it, the way we see it in our minds, the way we feel it. And imagery is, remember, just those things that play on the five senses. So right now, I just want you to Take a pause for a second and go back and see if you can find three of those images. Spitz was a practice fighter from Spitzenberg. Through the Arctic and across Canada and the Barrens, he had held his own with all manner of dogs and achieved to mastery over them. Bitter rage was his, but never blind rage. In passion to rend and destroy, he never forgot that his enemy was in like passion to rend and destroy. He never rushed till he was prepared to receive a rush, never attacked till he had first defended that attack. In vain, Buck strove to sink his teeth in the neck of the big white dog. Wherever his fangs struck for the softer flesh, they were countered by the fangs of Spitz. Fangs clashed fang, and lips were cut and bleeding, but Buck could not penetrate his enemy's guard. Then he warmed up and enveloped Spitz in a whirlwind of rushes. Time and time again he tried for the snow-white throat, where life bubbled near to the surface, and each time and every time Spitz slashed him and got away. Then Buck took to rushing, as though for the throat, when suddenly drawing back his head and curving in from the side, he would drive his shoulder at the shoulder of Spitz, as a ram by which to overthrow him. But instead, Buck's shoulder was slashed down each time as Spitz leapt lightly away. Spitz was untouched while Buck was streaming with blood and panting hard. The fight was growing desperate, and all the while the silent and wolfish circle waited to finish off whichever dog went down. As Buck grew winded, Spitz took to rushing, and he kept him staggering for footing. Once Buck went over, and the whole circle of sixty dogs started up, but he recovered himself almost in midair, and the circle sank down again and waited. But Buck possessed a quality that made for greatness imagination he found by instinct but he could f he fought by instinct but he could fight by head as well he rushed as though attempting the old shoulder trick but at the last instant swept low to the snow and in his teeth closed on spitz's left foreleg there was a crunch of breaking bone and the white dog faced him on three legs 
Thrice he tried to knock him over, then repeated the trick and broke the right foreleg. Despite the pain and helplessness, Spitz struggled madly to keep up. He saw the silent circle with gleaming eyes, lolling tongues, and silvery breaths drifting upward, closing in upon him, as he had seen similar circles close in upon beaten antagonists in the past. Only this time, he was the one who was beaten. There was no hope for him. Buck was inexorable. Mercy was a thing reserved for gentle, gentler climbs. He maneuvered for the final rush. The circle had tightened till he could feel the breaths of the huskies on his flank. He could see them beyond spits and to either side, half crouching for the, for the spring, their eyes fixed upon him. A pause seemed to fall. Every animal was motionless, as though turned to stone. Only Spitz quivered and bristled as he staggered back and forth, snarling with horrible menace, as though to frighten off impending death. Then Buck sprang in and out, but while he was in, shoulder had at last squarely met shoulder. The dark circle became a dot on the moon-flooded snow as Spitz disappeared from view. Buck stood and looked on, the successful champion, the dominant primordial beast, who had made his skill and found it good. So now that we've finished this smaller section, I want you to really think about how do you feel about Buck now? Do you find that you still have sympathy for him? Are you able to see that he is becoming wild and in the wild you have to be fiercer? Or do you find that you don't like him as much as you did before? Or do you find that you like him better? He is, after all, our protagonist. And by definition, a protagonist is our main character, but that character has to go through some kind of change. So Buck has gone through that change of being a very docile, domestic animal to now being a dominant primordial beast who is willing to fight for the to the death for mastership of this dog sled team. Um, so I want you to start thinking about that. You're also going to go through and do your multiple choice. And also, once again, for your short answers, two quotes from the text, please. So I want you to describe how Buck felt while chasing the rabbit. There are many instances that tell you many of those words like ecstasy. All right. Use those words. Use those quotes. And then in the end, on number seven, what traits have helped Buck to survive in his new environment? So one of those traits they just talked about in this in this fight um, for how he has to learn how to take spits down. Um, try to see if you can figure out what that trait is. And then what's another trait that you can find um, to describe what he has become by this point in the novel? So we're going to end it here. Please go and finish your Schoology work, and I will see you at the next video.